This episode is sponsored by The Jordan Harbinger Show, a podcast you should definitely check out since you're a fan of high-quality, fascinating shows. We're enjoying it, and we think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show, that's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to Future Hindsight, a podcast that takes big ideas about civic life and democracy and turns them into action items for you and me. I'm Mila Atmos. This is the first episode of our series on the social contract, and we're going to start with the history of this big idea. We're going to trace that history by starting with what life might look like without a social contract, with Thomas Hobbes' famous thought experiment, which he laid out in Leviathan 370 years ago. Thomas Hobbes is thinking about the problem of civil war when he discusses the state of nature in writing Leviathan, which he writes while he's in exile in France uh, from the civil war that had broken out in England and then the new regime that had overturned and eventually executed King Charles I. I'm Melissa Lane. I'm the class of 1943 professor of politics at Princeton University. So the state of nature is not only a state that might have existed in the past. It's actually a condition that can exist whenever we lack a civil authority, whenever we lack settled government. And so those in a civil war are in the state of nature. When you're in a state of civil war, as he famously says, life is nasty, brutish, and short. We're not able to trust each other, and so we're not able to cultivate prosperity, to cultivate friendships. We have no security. So the state of war is a state of misery. His fundamental question is, what does it take to exit that state of nature? The way to exit from the state of nature, Hobbes posits, is uh, to establish a sovereign And we do that by each person authorizing the sovereign and transferring their ability to judge what it would take to defend themselves and to protect their lives in the state of nature to the sovereign, who can then do that on behalf of all of them collectively. The thought is that if we try to do it completely on our own, we lapse into the state of war. We need to create a collective capacity for action that can be exercised on our behalf um, by some individual or group in the name of the state. That's Thomas Hobbes' vision of the social contract in a nutshell, provided by this week's guest, Princeton University's Melissa Lane. Hobbes isn't the only political philosopher to grapple with this idea. We're going to be talking about quite a few more, even tracing things all the way back to ancient Greece in this episode. But Hobbes is a good starting point. He immediately brings to our attention a push-pull that we're going to be looking at throughout the season of Future Hindsight, and that is the deal we're prepared to make with each other in order to live together as best we can. The push-pull of what we're prepared to give up in return for the protection of the state. So Hobbes has a very high threshold of what he thinks we have to give up if this is going to have any chance of working at all. So he thinks that unless we transfer this right to decide for ourselves about most aspects of fundamental decisions that will will affect our security, unless we transfer that right, we can't enjoy the protection that it could offer us. But the flip side of that is that he offers a formula, which is that we owe obedience in exchange for protection. That turns the 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 contract on its head that if we've given up those things and the sovereign is not in fact giving us protection of the kind that we were seeking then in fact we no longer owe the obedience and so the contract can be fundamentally violated or sort of abdicated by an an, an incompetent sovereign and in those situations 
we then revert to having our own rights again. But of course, it doesn't help us too much to have our own rights, Hobbes thinks, because then we're back in the state of war. So we need to then try to create a more competent government. So what was interesting about the moment that he was writing was that although his sympathies are clearly on the side of the the royalists, you know, the king before he had been executed, and then his son, who would eventually be restored um, to the throne. At the same time, this formula seems to suggest that we do have good reason to give a kind of de facto obedience to a contract that is in force, even if it isn't the one we would have ideally chosen, as long as it's giving that, us that protection and keeping us out of civil war. I specifically wanted to have Melissa on the show to talk to us about Thomas Hobbes and his ideas about the social contract, because how many times in the past couple of years have you heard someone say, the social contract is broken? Or how many times have you heard people talk about modern life in ways that echo Hobbes' vision of not being able to trust anyone, of lives that are nasty, brutish, and short? I also wanted Melissa to help guide us through centuries of thinking about the social contract and to tackle it as more than an old political theory or ancient philosophy. I wanted to see how thinking about the social contract can help us put together our civic action plans. If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you'll know that I believe that politics should be a part of our daily lives, that civic engagement is a thing we can all do. The barriers to action are actually really low, but the stakes of inaction are incredibly high. Professor Melissa Lane's title includes being director of Princeton's University Center for Human Values, and her work focuses on the history of political thought and political philosophy. So she really is the person to take us through this history, and I was determined to speak to her after something she wrote really struck a chord with me. Quote, Politics was not separate and specialized, but a pervasive and abiding concern for the matters belonging to the community in common. This means that classical ideas can provide a lens for focusing on the broad constitution and purposes of a community, something that is too often obscured in modernity by so many specialized aspects of the political apparatus. Can you help us connect the dots from this sentiment to the civic repercussions in our daily lives today? So when I wrote that, I was thinking of an even earlier period, uh, well before Hobbes, I was thinking of the, the ancient Greeks. And what I was suggesting there was that when we think about politics, we, we have to realize that we are, are ourselves constitutive parts. We're co-creators of political outcomes and social outcomes. And in some other thinkers much later, such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he used the language which was gendered at the, at the time, but of how do we turn men into citizens? How do we turn human beings in our sort of private capacity with each of us with our own individual concerns, our own private families, our own aspirations and hopes, but we have to make ourselves into citizens. And that might require a kind of a different way of looking at ourselves, realizing that unless we can see ourselves as participants in this collective communal enterprise, in a sense, again, we're, we're actually denuded. When If we really individualize ourselves completely and think of our own capacities without that collective understanding, we, we are sort of poor, forked creatures, you know, as, as Shakespeare would say, or as, you know, as Hobbes would say, we're, we're really without the kinds of capacities that it takes to create the parts of the world that we ourselves as individuals might most value. So the origins, I think, in a way, do go back to the Greeks, um, in, perhaps in a less technical sense than, than we find it in Hobbes and modern thinkers. But uh, the Greeks look at both sides of the social contract in a way. One way of looking at the social contract, as we talked about with Hobbes, is that these stylizes individuals as having a moment of choice and you know, choosing to enter in or not enter in. But there is another way of looking at the contract, which we find in uh, Plato's dialogue, the Crito, where the laws of Athens are talking to Socrates as he's in jail, uh, arguably having been convicted unjustly and about to be put to death. And the laws are saying to him, you were born here, you grew up here, we educated you, we gave you all the possibilities that you have of living in the city. And so you had the choice to either persuade us or obey us. The thought there is that there's, a, a in a sense, a deeper, richer political community that we may not choose. We're born into it. 
but we then have the opportunity to shape it. And if it, you know, if it hasn't hunted us down or treated us fundamentally unjustly or persecuted us in, you know, really profound ways, then we we can see ourselves as having an obligation to carry it on and to pass it on to the next generation. So I think that's also a, a slightly different perspective on the social contract, perhaps a bit less voluntaristic. The Greeks were also able to think of a voluntarist social contract. It's not that they didn't have that idea as well, but they also could complement it with the sense of a kind of identity that one could inherit, one could choose to embrace or to abandon. But if one chose to embrace it, then one had a kind of obligation to participate in its in its collective life in order to sustain it and and keep and keep it alive. What do you think then uh, is the neatest definition of the social contract? If we're using it as a frame, how would you define that frame? Or am I looking for a neat answer here where there isn't one? So to define the frame, I guess I would say the social contract is the realization that we can't preserve ourselves individually without creating a collective capacity to act. So the social contract is saying, you know, I I need to be part of enabling that collective capacity, and that's going to require me to give certain things up. I have to transfer certain abilities and rely on the collective judgment rather than always falling back on what I think is best or what I think is right. But 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 I do that because by doing that all of us are going to be better off. We're all going to be able to exit the state of nature, the state of mutual suspicion and hostility, and actually live as fellow citizens with trust in each other to be able to engage in these shared ends. And so the contract really calls our attention to this idea that we we have to give in order that we can receive. And we then we have to think about, you know, are we asking too much of some people? Is everyone receiving equally? Is everyone giving equally? So the idea of rights and responsibilities, um, I think, uh, is, is, is a way of summing up what the contract requires. So if we move on from classical thought and from Hobbes' negative framing of the social contract, um, let's explore some of the thinkers who grappled with this idea as well, Rousseau and Locke. You just mentioned Rousseau. How do they help us think about the social contract? So as we think about what Locke and Rousseau do with the idea of the contract, um, we can see them as they differ and in sometimes complement Hobbes in different ways. So in the case of Locke, what changes is that Locke thinks that we're in a much better position in the state of nature than Hobbes did. And we're in a better position, not particularly materially necessarily, although he may have thought that as well, but from the standpoint that he thinks that we can more securely protect ourselves in the state of nature. We can each execute our own rights to kind of protect ourselves and even rely on others or invoke others. So for Locke, Therefore, the state has to be, in a way, doing much more for us than we could do for ourselves. But again, if the state fails in doing that, if it starts treating us in arbitrary or capricious ways and makes us, again, less able to benefit from communal living than we would have been otherwise, then Locke does entertain the thought of revolution. We can change the government in order to install a government that will better suit our ends. And the, that's one of the important ways in which not only Locke, but Locke, among other thinkers, was significant in the American founding. Whereas Rousseau, as I mentioned before, writing in the mid-18th century, publishing The Social Contract in 1762 – really focuses on the idea of this transformation of the natural human person into a citizen and the way that the social contract can only work in his view if that's the lens through which we come to see the world. We we see ourselves as members of a community that is governing itself freely. So famously, the social contract begins, man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains, again, with this gendered language. And the thought is that we are in chains because we are in political states that tyrannize and dominate over us and in which we're not governing ourselves as political equals underpinned by a sentiment of a general will in which we all share. So for Rousseau, it's not something that we could sort of 
turn on or off. We have to be members of a whole culture in a state that would support those sentiments. So he really brings the idea of the kind of civic culture, the civic religion, actually, the civil religion that a state needs that can support the the kinds of civic identity that a true social contract would require. We're going to pause for a moment to hear from our sponsor, and then we'll have more from Melissa Lane on the social contract and its history. But first, I wanted to talk to you about The Jordan Harbinger Show. Jordan covers a wide range of topics through weekly interviews with heavy-hitting guests, and he dives into the minds of fascinating people, from athletes, authors, and scientists, to CEOs, government officials, and FBI agents. With over 570 episodes, it might be tough to know where to start, but I'm going to recommend you check out Jordan's conversation with Kai Fu Lee, the CEO of Sinovation Ventures and former president of Google China. They discuss everything AI, including how to keep data free from human and cultural biases and how humans can avoid displacement when all the repetitive, soul-crushing jobs are done by robots. The podcast covers a lot, but Jordan has an amazing knack of pulling useful pieces of advice from his guests. You'll find things that you can apply to your own life, like actionable routine changes to boost your productivity, or even just a slight mindset tweak that changes how you see the world. You can't go wrong with adding The Jordan Harbinger Show to your rotation. It's incredibly interesting. There's never a dull show. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show, that's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, let's get back to my conversation with Professor Melissa Lane. She's helping us understand the social contract in its historical context and what this big idea might mean for our current politics. As we think about the United States, in what ways are the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution based in a social contract now that you've redefined it for us? So the Declaration, of course, um, very beautifully is a kind of contract among you know, the particular group of the signers of the Declaration, of course, acting in a way on, on behalf of others, where they literally conclude by saying they're going to pool their life, liberty, and their sacred honor and entrust that to each other in order that they can act collectively in declaring this independence. So it exactly suggests how far you might need to go. You might need to die for this social contract. You might need to, you know, you, you're, you're literally putting your life and your honor in the hands of of others by creating it. And, you know, when states do wrong, if states mistreat, oppress, dominate, fight unjust wars, enslave, all those things that states can do wrong, we as citizens who are parties to that contract bear a share of that guilt. We have dirty hands because the state is acting in our name. Of course, the Constitution then it has a more complex architecture because it's we the people all collectively, but then it's ratified state by state. And so there's an important idea of a, you know, a kind of federal contract as well, a two-level contract where we're members of our state governments and then the states also form a, a union among among themselves. But but the contra- the Constitution begins, of course, in the preamble by making that the case, you know, for the people as a whole. In preparation for this interview, I actually reread some Locke. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I thought that, you know, the influence of John Locke is quite deep on the U.S. Constitution. The, the, the idea that Locke is kind of the pivotal figure on the Constitution has been nuanced by historians in recent years. Locke is not the only thinker who's important for the founders, but he is important nevertheless. And what he gives is this idea that the state could fundamentally be violating the very purposes with which they were entrusted with power. And so if you think again about the structure of the Declaration, for example, it catalogs all the ways in which the King of England and the Parliament has been acting so as to invade the liberties of the colonists, to act as a tyrant in the ways that it was taxing without representation, in the way that it was quartering soldiers in their home without their consent, and so on. All of those violations mean that ultimately the government isn't doing for the American colonists 
what Locke had said that it needed to do to help them to better protect themselves. Rather than better protecting them, it was actually what was dominating them and attacking them and tyrannizing over them. And so in that situation, then just as Hobbes in another way had also thought, it had gone so far that that government can no longer claim to be giving protection. And so obedience is no longer owed. That's the Hobbesian formula, but Locke would have a similar idea. And so in that situation, then a revolution could be justified which would be, interestingly, not necessarily a violating of the the community among the colonists themselves, but a change of government so that the government would no longer be battening upon the people, but would rather genuinely now be designed to protect them. Locke's ideas in particular have another side to them, which is very important to say, which is that Locke also Uh, because of his views about the ability to claim property in a state of nature only if one were improving that property in certain ways, laboring on it. Locke's ideas had a very damaging effect in justifying certain kinds of imperialism and colonialism because the thought was that indigenous peoples were not laboring and working the land in the kinds of ways that Locke and and others would recognize as as valid. So that's very complex because, you know, of course, there's another sense in which post-colonial thought also shares an idea that a colonial oppressor needs to be overthrown in order to install a government which more genuinely represents and protects the people. So there's some continuity there with the social contract tradition, but it was ironically also having to overcome colonial regimes that had been not uniquely justified by Locke, but sometimes justified by thoughts um, of that kind. Right. Yeah. Well, Locke really was a proponent of property ownership and accumulating as much property as possible. How does capitalism uh, and slavery, you know, if you think about property ownership, fit into the American social contract? Yeah, so that's a really fundamental and and crucially important question. The terrible, destructive irony and paradox is that as the concept of property was developed in the American colonies, it included property in supposed property in human beings. It included slaves. And Locke, therefore, if you apply to Lockean lens, at least from one point of view, The Lockean lens would say, you know, those people are not human beings who are party to the contract. They're on the side of the property, which is owned by the slave owners who are party to the contract. Um, Now, there's a lot of historical debate at the moment about how we should view the Constitution itself in relation to slavery, because on the one hand, it's true that the Constitution establishes slavery. It doesn't nationalize slavery, but it acknowledges slavery in the several states and, of course, infamously counts slaves as only a fraction of a person uh, when the census would be uh, apportioned. And, and so that fundamental struggle of enslaved people to assert their independence and their right to be party to the contract in their own names and to remake the contract such that it it truly benefited them, such that they were getting uh, protection in exchange for obedience rather than being forced to obey through the whip and, and the chain. A fundamental struggle that goes on, of course, through the antebellum era into the Civil War and then again with the century long continuing struggle against the legacy of Jim Crow and the ways in which both slavery and the Jim Crow regime have continued to uh, distort uh, and and undermine the the true independence of of all Americans, uh, including Americans of color, in in claiming that right to be full participants in the social contract. So you've taken us on a whistle stop tour of thousands of years of social contract theory. Are there specific ideas from way back that you think could be helpful to us right here and now? So I think that this idea from the ancient Greeks that We need to recognize our agency as constitutive parts of the society and the possibility that that we can, through reshaping the ideas and values and practices that we share, that we propagate, that we engage in, that's part of being a citizen and it's part of changing the public culture. Indeed, efforts such as this podcast, I think, are contributions to the, the culture of the community that that the social contract would would require. So for example, I, I wrote a book some years ago called Eco Republic, which 
argued that if we're going to achieve a sustainable society, a sustainable society has to be underwritten by values and norms and individual motivations that will keep it stable and keep it sustainable. So the ancients weren't thinking about ecological sustainability for the most part, although there are moments, but for the most part, of course, they weren't. But they were thinking about what it takes for a society to be genuinely stable rather than to be such that it's it has fault lines, meaning that some people are always going to be disaffected and and alienated. And so I think thinking about that and realizing that the social contract is not merely a kind of formalistic, legalistic structure of government, but that actually a constitution is a way of life. The, the meaning of the Greek word politeia doesn't just mean a constitution in the sense of a, a formal uh, structure of government and not necessarily a written constitution, but it can also mean the way of life of the citizens that sustains and animates that constitution. And for me, that's a really okay. important insight. Yes, I totally agree. Although I don't think that's really happening right now. But are there examples that you've seen, instances where you see the social contract at work today actually happening? So one interesting example is the mutual aid groups that have sprung up in many, many cities many of them in response to the pandemic, although, you know, others existed before. And the mutual aid is a concept where everyone participates as much as they're able and they ask for what they need and the group collaborates kind of informally in trying to sustain and provide to its members and also to address ways in which society is structurally threatening or undermining the conditions of a flourishing life for, for all people in a given community. And so mutual aid is a kind of interesting cousin of the social contract, if you will, because it strips away the legal apparatus and asks us to go back to just the social relationship. So I don't think that would work on a national scale, but I think that people participating in that in a local way is very much in the spirit of the sort of New England town meetings that Tocqueville celebrated in the 19th century and other kinds of examples of local democracy that have always existed in the United States and that, you know, really provide an illustration of people from different backgrounds recognizing that they can step up and act as part of the solution um, to the to the question of how do we weave the social fabric um, back together and make the contract something meaningful in its promise of meaningful protection for all. So, well, following on from that, how do you think about the usefulness of the social contract when historically, and in some ways, of course, presently today, uh, so many categories of persons have been excluded from it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that is a really profound question. The sort of easier answer, which was still in no way easy in practice and took, you know, generations of activists struggle to to achieve is to say that people could fight to be included, to become included, to strip away the exclusivist readings and the exclusions and to bring inclusion. And if you look at the very complex um, political thought of Frederick Douglass, for example, he Ultimately, although he in moments excoriated the, the Declaration of Independence saying in his famous address, what to the slave is the 4th of July, at the same time, in, in other moments, he insisted that the Constitution itself was capable of not only not obstructing, but even potentially coming to facilitate the abolition of slavery and the full enfranchisement of people who had been excluded, the, the formerly enslaved people. So in one way, one can say, you know, the, that of course, when you have a contract, some people are party to it, others not, and then we can try to expand the circle. And that is a powerful idea. But I think we also should be, you know, self-critical that there are limits to that idea or that we need to recognize that it can still have costs. And, you know, philosophers have pointed out that we're, we may still be excluding animals and, you know, the non-human world, the very idea of a contract, which seems to suggest a certain capacity for contract making among parties, may seem that it's only suited to humans and not going to be helpful for thinking about our relations with nature more broadly. And, and more broadly, as a contract does seem to have an idea that you know, some people are in and some people are out. Some people are party and some people are not a party to. It may seem to invite that kind of politics. Now, I think that there are ways to try to rethink it and broaden it. We can go back to that broader idea of a kind of compact rather than a contract. So not everyone who 
is included in the social fabric of a compact has to have the contractual capacity maybe to have formed it in the first place. You know, you could you could think that. You can think about um, a, a kind of um, metaphorical expansion of the political community. But I think that we have to always be conscious that that the metaphor of a contract may in may be allowing some exclusion that we may not be aware of, even as we work to include as much as we can, and even as we celebrate the the battles for inclusion that have been won and those that are still being fought. Can you tell us a little bit more the difference between a contract and a compact in this in this context? Yeah, I mean, it, I'm using it this way. It's not that there's a f- fixed definition that I'm relying on. But I think that a contract can bring with it the metaphor of a specific, definite, negotiated terms. You know, so we we know exactly who it's between. We know exactly what the contract demands. We could take it to court if we needed to. You know, and part of the what's afflicted the social contract tradition from the beginning is people saying, well, but who made this contract? How do we know that we made it? You say that we're all parties to it, but, you know, we, we never did that. And so David Hume in the 18th century already was launching attacks on the social contract tradition, kind of making fun of the idea that there could ever have been an original contract. When would that have been? Even if it had been made among one generation, what binds the next generation and so on. And so I'm stylizing the idea of a compact to be perhaps one in which we don't think of ourselves as individually having been made in as much as we might have been born into it. And then we can choose whether we think it's ideals and demands are ones that we want to live up to or whether we want to change it. So rather than looking for that original founding moment, we can say, well, it, it may be an ongoing project and, and maybe one that not everyone who's included in it could have made. There may be some people who didn't have the capacity to make a treaty, as it were, you know, children or other people. But nevertheless, we see them as included in some way. But I think of it as a kind of way of working with the contract idea, remodeling it, reflecting on it, not abandoning it or, or changing altogether. Right, right. So um, it's just more inclusive. But speaking of inclusivity and fighting for who's in and who's out, I was thinking about January 6th, and I wondered, is that a sign of the social contract breaking? What do you think? I think that what happened on January 6th was, to me, to me uh, profoundly disturbing and profoundly worrying uh, because it it suggested that the, the the basic rituals of the the political life of the country which depend on a peaceful transfer of power uh, were being undermined by a self-appointed group who uh, you know who who tried to stop those proceedings with violence and threatened those who had been duly authorized to carry them out after the January 6th insurrection, you wrote that Trump was the real anarchist. And uh, I was wondering, how has his term in office affected uh, our social contract? Like, has his term in office broken it to a point of no return? So when I wrote that Trump was the true anarchist, I was drawing on the original Greek meaning of the word anarchia, which literally means an absence of rule or office, and it can mean an absence of someone acting as a ruler or an office holder. And so what I was arguing was that I think that in his behavior in regard to January 6th and in other specific ways through his term that that we can identify, Trump was either indifferent or actively hostile to some of the fundamental duties of his office in terms of Uh, protecting and upholding the rule of law, which the oath of office of the president requires him to protect, protecting and upholding the Constitution in the case of the January 6th riots and the procedure for the transfer of power um, through the uh, electoral system, which the Constitution prescribes. And so in, in acting in those ways, he was the one who was not acting as an office holder. He was not truly living up to the the fundamental demands of an office holder within an accountable system of government. And so that is a form of anarchy. That's anar- anarchy from above, if you will, which is different, I think, from what people usually mean when they talk of anarchy, which is a kind of anarchy uh, from below. Thinking about January 6th and where we are today, 
you know, in October of 2021, what do you think are the actual terms of our current social contract? What is our current state? I, I think that we are really being fundamentally asked to reaffirm the values of a peaceful self-government and a self-government that allows for the legitimacy of opposition, the legitimacy of disagreement, and supports those in power when they are acting according to the norms that their offices require, supports their doing so even when they may come from a party that one does not support. This has you know, become very difficult because at the same time, it's possible for someone in office to act in such a way that they fundamentally violate the duties that that office brings with it. And I think when that happens, that in itself is a different kind of threat to the social contract. So I think there are kind of two kinds of threats. There's, if you will, the threat that can come from above. If an elected office holder or an appointed office holder, in the case of, of judges, violates the the basic premise of the contract, which is that those in power are using that power for the good of the ruled. Right? So that, again, goes back to protection for obedience. The people in power have that power through the contract because they are meant to be using it for our good, not their own. And so if they're abusing that for their own ends or indifferent or hostile to what the public good requires, that's one kind of problem. And then there's the problem from below. There's the problem of citizens not being willing to be bound by what the rule of law and office holding does require of them legitimately. So I think we kind of need to look at both ends of that. You know, the only good thing about it is that one can say that it's made us wake up to how fragile this experiment in self-government is. You know, and I study Plato's thought, and people always used to say to me, how can you study Plato? He was hostile to democracy. You know, how is that relevant today? And I would always say, you know, Plato poses very fundamental challenges. He, he has reasons that he thinks it's going to be difficult for democracy to be a good regime, to be the kind of regime that could protect us and offer us a meaningful social contract in a stable way. And it's kind of up to us to prove him wrong. We can't just say, oh, well, Plato was anti-democratic, so he must be wrong. We have to say, okay, these are the ways we're going to overcome those fissures in democracy, those fault lines in democracy. And many of them are the ones that we're seeing, the rejection of expertise, the rejection of duly constituted authority, all those things. And so, you know, I feel like really the scales have fallen from our eyes in a way. And we've realized that, you know, these are real challenges that we may fail to meet as a country, as a people, as individuals. And so it really is important that people ask themselves the kinds of questions that I know that the series will be asking. Yes. Reading Plato is so informative uh, in so many ways, like you said, uh, and really sheds light on the problems that we have today. So uh, on that note, looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? So I think some of the mutual aid groups and those kinds of civic efforts that people have realized that they need to make to protect one another, to look out for one another, people volunteering in, in civic causes, people who are willing to still serve as election officials despite the threats of violence. I mean, I think that those people are heroes of our democracy. Um, Princeton University, where I teach, recently lost a, a woman named Laura Wooten, who at the time of her death was the longest serving uh, poll worker in the United States and had 79 continuous years of volunteering as a poll worker in the vicinity of Princeton, New Jersey. That's an amazing, unparalleled record of civic service. And that's a kind of civic duty and civic service, you know, the people who will stand in long lines to vote in the face of the fact that the distribution of opportunities to vote near where you live and conveniently to where you might work or live are very unevenly distributed. And the people who will withstand that and stand in line to do that, I think, are heroes. So, you know, there are reasons for hope, but it's also a time for vigilance and it's not a time for complacency. Yes, definitely. So, well, you know, as we round out the interview here, um, I usually ask for two things an everyday person could be doing, but you're adding something else to our civic action toolkit, uh, and that is the tools for thinking about the social contract, the core theme of this season. So if there were just two things you wanted us to take away from this conversation about the social contract, two key concepts that we need to keep in mind as we explore the social contract today, what are those? 
So first of all, I would say it's incredibly important to vote. I think people often think, you know, my vote is just one vote among so many. It doesn't matter. But think of the generations of people who fought for the right to vote, women, women of color, men of color, people who were immigrants who were excluded in various ways, people who are unauthorized immigrants and don't have the right to vote. So I think those who have the right to vote need to realize how fundamental it is that it is the fundamental way in which you have a say in making the contract meaningful and making it what it is. And then the second thing I would say is we tend to think, what is the contract doing for me? What is the government doing for me? And of course, that's a legitimate thought. But I would also say, think about what is the contract doing for others? And is it equally protecting me and them? Is the contract protecting us all equally? Are there people who are systematically uh, undermined or cast aside or marginalized from its full protection? And unless everyone who is or should be party to the contract is being equally protected, then there's a fundamental sense in which the contract itself is broken. So, you know, play your part in it. And you can play a part, of course, in the broader civic life, even if you can't vote. You can do other things to support the civic fabric. You can participate in many other ways. I don't mean to say that voting is the only thing and that if you can't vote for whatever reason, you can't contribute. But I think vote, but then also realize and think about the different ways in which people may not be benefiting and the threat that that itself poses to the contract and the need to vote in such a way that we can protect uh, everyone equally and make sure that their capacity both to contribute and to enjoy true peace, security, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is, is genuinely equal. Thank you. Melissa Lane is the class of 1943 professor of politics and director of University Center for Human Values at Princeton University. Her work focuses on the history of political thought and political philosophy. Thank you for joining us on Future Hindsight. Thank you. Next week on Future Hindsight, how can we build a better social contract here and around the world? I'm going to be talking with an internationally renowned economist about how we might do that. Bernes Minou Shafiq is the director of the London School of Economics. She's worked in international development and is a former central banker at the World Bank and the IMF. I had a lot of aha moments in our conversation about what's broken in our current system and what it would take to repair those things. What We Owe Each Other is the title of Minusha's book, and figuring out what we owe each other locally, globally, is central to the season of Future Hindsight. That's next week. This podcast was produced for Future Hindsight by Sarah Burningham, Riva Goldberg, Zoe Sullivan, and Bart Warshaw of the Cocoon Collective. Zach Travis is our associate producer. Until next time, stay engaged. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.